Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Please be seated. We're continuing our series, Great Cloud of Witnesses, and today we're going to be talking about Jarena Lee, who doesn't often show up in a lot of our history books, but is an important figure, as I'll, I'll talk about. But first, a question for you. Have you ever been told that you couldn't do something that you knew for sure that you could? Have you ever been told that you weren't quite the right fit for a job even though it was clear in your mind that you had the skills to perform? Have you, have you ever been told that it was because of who you were that you weren't enough? If so, what did you do? Did you obey and do what you were told and leave your dreams behind? Or did you carve your own path and live the life that you felt in your soul that you were meant to live? Did you ignore dissenting voices and listen to the one voice speaking to you from your heart? Jarena Lee was the latter. Jarena Lee, as far as historians can tell, the first African-American woman preacher in the United States. And the road taking her there was anything but smooth. Born on February 11th, 1783 in Cape May, New Jersey, Jarena worked as a servant maid from a young age. Her parents taught her very little about religion or the Christian faith, but she encountered Christian teachings here and there, specifically from the Psalms, which made a tremendous impact on her, but not the way you'd expect. And she heard a Presbyterian missionary preach, and the preacher shared these words from a common hymn at the time. These words are, Lord, I am vile, conceived in sin, born unholy and unclean, sprung from man whose guilty fall, corrupts the race and taints us all. Pete, next week? <laughs> yeah? Presbyterians have a word for this. They call it total depravity. It means we're no, we're no good. We're just really awful human beings right from the get-go. And Jarena took these words to heart and believed that her soul was corrupt and worthless and that there was nothing good in her. And so she sunk into a deep depression, and she felt so hopeless that she entertained thoughts of suicide. But then she found her way to the African Methodist Episcopal Church, and she heard Bishop Richard Allen speak at Bethel Church in Philadelphia. And something awakened in her, or something or someone visited her, or both. Either way, Richard Allen's sermon made a life-changing impact on her. And I'm going to quote it. It's at length, but I think we need to hear the whole thing. This is the way she tells it. The man who was to speak in the afternoon of that day was the Reverend Richard Allen, since Bishop of the African Episcopal Methodists in America. During the labors of this man that afternoon, I had come to the conclusion that this is the people to which my heart unites. And so it happened that as soon as the service closed, he invited such as felt a desire to, free, to flee the wrath to come, to unite on trial with them. I embraced the opportunity. Three weeks from that day, my soul was gloriously converted, converted to God under preaching at the very outset of the sermon. The text was barely pronounced, which was, I perceive thy heart is not right in the sight of God when there appeared to my view in the center of, of the heart one sin. And this was malice against one particular individual who had strove deeply to injure me, which I resented. At this discovery, I said, Lord, forgive every creature. That instant, it appeared to me as if a garment which had entirely enveloped my whole person, even to to my finger's end, split at the crown of my head, and was stripped away from me, passing like a shadow from my sight, when the glory of God seemed to cover me in its stead. That moment, though hundreds were present, I did leap to my feet and declare that God, for Christ's sake, had pardoned the sins of my soul. 
Great was the ecstasy of my mind, for I felt that not only the sin of malice was pardoned, but all other sins were swept away altogether. That day was the first when my heart had believed, and my tongue had made confession unto salvation. The first words uttered, a part of that song which shall fill eternity with its sound, was glory to God. For a few moments I had power to exhort sinners and to tell of the wonders and of the goodness of him who had clothed me with his salvation. During this, the minister was silent until my soul felt its duty had been performed when he declared another witness of the power of Christ to forgive sins on earth was manifest in my conversion. What does your conversion sound like? What I like about this is she identified forgiveness of an individual with being forgiven of sin. The two were held together with her. But also at that moment, she just realized she wasn't worthless, but that God had forgiven her sins, and she was a new creation, beloved and holy, and she knew that her life had changed. And then soon after her conversion, she began hearing voices. Yes, it's one of those stories. This is the way she tells it. But to my utter surprise, there seemed to sound a voice which I thought I distinctly heard, and most certainly understand, which said to me, go preach the gospel. I immediately replied aloud, no one will believe me. Again I listened, and again the same voice seemed to say, preach the gospel. I will put words in your mouth, and I will turn your enemies to become your friends. Jerina's call echoes that of Isaiah, whom we had heard earlier. Isaiah felt unqualified to bring God's word to the people. He felt too dirty, too sinful, too, too awful to be a mouthpiece for the Almighty. But then the angel touched his lips, purifying him, putting the word on them. Because as we heard, Isaiah recounts this moment. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. Here am I. Send me. Jerina knew those, those words were for her as well. Because God has a way of turning the unclean clean, of calling the unqualified and teaching them what to say. God has a way of turning our weaknesses into strength. That was true of Isaiah, and it was certainly true of Jerina Lee. Because Jerina Lee told her story to Richard Allen, the bishop, who said, women don't preach. And it was true. No woman had ever stood in his or any other pulpit in the U.S. and preached. He told her that the voices that she heard weren't from God and that she should just accept her place as a domestic servant. But Jerina knew that this wasn't true. She felt inside her a calling that just wouldn't go away. Then one Sunday morning at Bethel Church, a guest preacher came along and started stumbling over his words. And then he just stopped talking altogether, trying to figure out where he was in his sermon. His notes were all over the place. And the crowd looked stunned at this guest preacher who was just at a loss for words. He just stopped talking. And then Jerina Lee popped up from her seat and started preaching from where the guest preacher left off. And she held the crowd with the power of her proclamation. 
At first, when she was finished, she was afraid that Bishop Allen would scold her for her impromptu preaching. After all, she was told in no uncertain terms that a woman's place is not in the pulpit. But instead, Richard Allen was so impressed with her preaching that he gave her permission to preach on a circuit, which meant that she went town to town to town, and she was allowed to hold prayer meetings in her home. It was clear to his ears that Jarena was preaching a powerful word from the Lord. Her words rang so true that they could only come from God. And that's all she needed. Her and her friend packed up their things, and she, together they traveled thousands of miles, preaching 178 sermons. And her preaching took her to Maryland, a slave state, where it is recorded that the slaves walked 21 miles just to hear her preach. But Jarena Lee not only preached a gospel of personal salvation, she also preached against slavery. She believed that salvation wasn't just an assurance of paradise after you died, but it was the promise of a just world today. She became an outspoken abolitionist and joined the American Anti-Slavery Society in 1839. She believed in the dignity of every person, and the ownership of other human beings was an abomination before the Lord. So she preached racial equality as evidence of God's salvation. For her, the two were not separate. When I read Jarena Lee's story, I can't help but marvel at the forces that were against her and that she was able to overcome the obstacles that would have stopped a lesser person. So often we think of God as being like the problem solver, the one that will make our paths smooth, the one that will remove any stumbling block that gets in our way of living the life we feel God wants us to live. But I think what we've learned from Jarena Lee is that God gives us strength to handle those obstacles. God gave Jarena ears to hear Richard Allen's preaching. God gave her courage to spontaneously stand up and preach in a full church when the guest preacher fell silent. God gave her tenacity to keep asking Bishop Allen for permission to preach within her community. And God gave her audacity to preach in a slave state where her life would be in danger. She was born a woman in a male-dominated society and an African-American in a white-controlled country. She stood up to the powers of her world and demanded that she be included. She confronted a world that told women, especially black women, to sit down and shut up, and she declared, no, you will listen to me. She aggravated the status quo by lifting her voice in public to declare the salvation of the Lord for all people. She became a living social transformation, a walking sermon, a pulsating proclamation. She cleared the path for women who aspired to leadership and for men who believed that women are equal partners in life and for everyone who believed that all people are created in God's image regardless of skin color. Jarena Lee died penniless in Philadelphia sometime in early 1864. When I think of her legacy, I think of in connecting with our legacy as, as Lutherans, in light of our own Lutheran tradition, she was light years ahead of us. The predecessor bodies that make up our own Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada ordained its first woman preacher in 1976, within my lifetime. That was Reverend Pamela McGee, who served St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Morrisburg, Ontario, just right down the road from my first congregation. And now women clergy make up roughly half of our pastors, and until recently, half our bishops were women. And we have a female national bishop, Reverend Susan Johnson. We have made significant progress in bringing women to leadership in our churches. But I don't just see Jarena Lee as a groundbreaker for women's equality or for racial justice, although she is definitely that, and that is her key contribution to history. 
But for us as Christians, I see Jarena Lee as evidence of what is possible. I see Jarena Lee as a sign that God is still active and alive, doing the impossible, bringing good news to the poor, setting the captives free, offering sight to those who are blind to injustice, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim that this is the year of our Lord's favor. I look at Jarena Lee's life and work and see that giving up hope is not an option. A new world is possible. Changed lives are possible. Transformed hearts are possible. As soon as she opened her mouth, her mere presence announced that God was doing something new. God was breaking down old barriers that kept people in servitude. God was shattering expectations of what people could say and do. God was crushing old beliefs and stale doctrines that served only the powerful few. God was lifting up the lowly, putting potent words in their mouths. God was giving hungry ears living bread. God was announcing that a new world was arriving. Have you ever felt to give up hope sometime in your life? Have you ever thought to give up hope that the world would get any better? Have you ever asked, why bother in your life and in your world? Because the world just seems so out of control, that it seems in a downward trajectory, and you can't see it heading upwards. I have to admit, in my lesser moments, I have entertained thoughts of hopelessness. I have wondered if this world will get the healing that it needs. I have doubted God's goodness against human evil and human selfishness because the world seems so divided. Many of our leaders are displaying a me-first attitude which only compounds divisions. And there are times when it looks like we've forgotten our common humanity. Then I go on a news fast and I talk to people and I see what people are doing in the community. I connect with others on a face-to-face -face human level, unmediated by what's going on on a screen. And when I do that, I see Jarena Lee's spirit and what is happening all around us. And I realize that she is right. God is bringing about a new world. We just don't see it on TV. It's not on our Facebook feed where the angriest and most destructive voices dominate. What God has set in motion through people like Jarena Lee has reached us. It's in people's kindness towards others. It's in voices raised on behalf of hurting people. It's in those looking at what can be done instead of what can't be done. It's in how injustice is being confronted. It's in how we find ways to lift each other up. Is this world how God wants it? Not yet. But Jarena Lee's message for us is that we don't have the luxury of giving up hope. We don't have the luxury of stepping back believing that destructive voices, forces will triumph. We don't have the luxury of sinking into futility. She didn't have that option. And out of her station in life, overcoming all obstacles, believing in what was possible, and trusting that God was leading her, she jolted history, which is still being felt today. And that's because she believed in God's vision for this world, and she preached what she saw God doing. Because she preached of a day when we don't have to talk about race, she preached of a day when we don't have to talk about gender. She preached of a day when we don't have to talk about poverty. She preached of a day when our ethnic divisions will be overcome. She preached of a day when we don't have to prepare for war. She preached of a day when Jesus is glorified in all that we do. She preached of a day when God's power flows through this world. She preached of a day when enemies became friends, when judgment turns to compassion, when anger turns to care, and the lowly are lifted up. 
She preached of a day when every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. What boundaries do you need pushed? What expectations do you need to break out of? What's holding you back from living how God wants you to live? Maybe God is pushing the boundaries of what you can see, opening your vision to a world you never dreamed possible. Maybe God is confounding the expectations that you put on yourself because you believed in the limitations that you were taught. Maybe God is breaking you loose, set free to live how you feel God is calling you to live. Because today, God is breaking boundaries. God is confounding expectations. God is setting people free to live how God wants you to live, as if God's promised future has come to you this day. Because as Jorina Lee has taught us, with God, anything is possible. She finishes her, auto, her journal, her autobiography, knowing that her work is never finished because God's work is never finished. She is always growing, always proclaiming, running the race that is put before her and trusting that God will carry her over the finish line. And I think her final words can be our final words as people of faith, as a community of Christ. She says this, I now conclude by requesting the prayers of God's people everywhere who worship in his holy fear to pray for me that I ever may endeavor to keep a conscience void of offense either toward God or man. For I feel as anxious to blow the trumpet in Zion and to sound the alarm in God's holy mount as ever. And she concludes with a different hymn than the one she heard so many years ago. Though nature's strength decay and earth and hell withstand, to Canaan's land I'll urge my way at his divine command. And may this be so among us. Amen.